Are you ready for Christmas yet? Have you been asked that question yet this year? I mean, Christmas is over four weeks away. It's not even December yet. But yes, I have already been asked that question twice in the last week or two. For most people, the question centers around gifts and social events, right? Have you purchased all your Christmas gifts? That's kind of what they mean. And as an aside, it's usually asked by all those people who have already purchased them all. Are your plans set for Christmas? Are you traveling or hosting? Who are you spending Christmas Eve with and who are you spending Christmas Day with? Do you have any large Christmas parties coming up? Are you ready for Christmas yet? This can be a dangerous question when you ask a minister. On one hand, the response could be one of frustration and a sense of being overwhelmed. Are you kidding me? Candle lighting, special music, extra congregational activities, a Christmas pageant, maybe a carol sing. Can't forget about Christmas Eve. It's the largest service of the year. Everyone wants it to be perfect. And oh yeah, I have to fit in my own personal Christmas stuff too. But on the other hand, I would love to say, are you ready for Christmas yet? Well, yes, I'm reading through the book of Isaiah for the next four weeks to prepare myself for the coming of the Christ child. And an answer like that is a sure way that you'll never get asked by that person again. Are you ready for Christmas? I mean, we should get ready for Christmas physically, living into our traditions, celebrating those traditions that have been passed down to us and carry so much personal meaning. And most people, they're already preparing for Christmas by hauling the decorations down from the attic or in from the garage or up from the basement. The most industrious of those amongst us, perhaps they've even purchased or made some of their gifts already. But preparing for Christmas is also a spiritual matter. Since Advent refers to the coming of Christ, the season of Advent is when we celebrate that coming. We must get ready to receive him. The prophet Isaiah was getting ready for the coming of the Messiah 800 years before Christ's arrival. In the book that bears his name that we read from this morning, Isaiah has provided help for us to get ready for Advent. In some ways, Isaiah's prophecies were fulfilled in the first advent of the Messiah. But on the other hand, the complete fulfillment of God's promises concerning the last days, they will not come about until the second advent of Jesus, until Jesus comes again. We live our spiritual lives then between the already and the not yet. And it often seems that we live our physical lives there too, right? Between the already and the not yet. And that can be a hard place to live sometimes, right? Doesn't it seem that, that sometimes life just used to be simpler? Or is that just my imagination? I mean, there does seem to be a longing, a general longing to go back to a simpler time, to a greater time, to a time perhaps when things made more sense. But did such a time ever really exist? I mean, there were times when I thought I had it all figured out, when things were easier for me, and no doubt there were times when things seemed easier for you. But was it easier for everyone? I remember when it felt like everything was pretty simple, but I didn't realize as a child the anxiety that my parents were under to give me that simple life. And choices that perhaps I now question, they were choices made out of fear of the moment, about, or out of a desire to provide for their children. And they made sense at the time. But why do we question? Why does life not seem so simple? I would suggest it's because our vision is limited. At least that seems to be our problem. We can't see well. We can't see what we need to see. We can't see God at work in the world. We are left to muddle through the best we can. And sometimes our best just isn't enough. What we see troubles us. It limits us, it divides us. 
What we see is what is right in front of our very faces, problems to solve, roadblocks to navigate. But what if we could see farther? What if we could see better? What if we could see more? What if we could see God at work? When we read Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 5, we usually skip right to the prophecy, and rightly so. It's what's so compelling, it's what's so radical about it. And prophecy is what drives us during this season of Advent. We lean into these words so completely, so hopefully, even though we doubt the reality of the words themselves, right? They're, they're just a naive fantasy that there could be peace in the world. I mean, all we see is war and conflicts and division and enemies. It makes a nice poster to hang up on the wall in a kid's room, a pipe dream for those who don't know how the world works. Cute words in a Christmas card, peace on earth. But that's about as far as we will go. But let's back up a moment. Before we tackle this image of peace, this hope, let's take another look. In verse 1, we are introduced to the prophet, Isaiah, son of Amos. He has family. He's rooted. He works for the southern kingdom of Judah in its capital city, Jerusalem, which, by the way, means city of peace. Our psalm this morning invites us to see Jerusalem as a city of peace, a city bound firmly together, a city of destination, a city that fulfills a divine vision. It seems almost ironic, doesn't it? Jerusalem, the city of peace, in one of the most contentious areas of the planet, a place where just this week two bombs were detonated at bus stops, injuring 14 and killing one Canadian teenager. Jerusalem, a place where how many temples were built and destroyed, where how many walls were built and lines drawn, where how many times have the alleys echoed with the booted walk of soldiers and streets washed in blood. I mean, it's not new, this conflict, this battleground in a city of peace. It's been a place of struggle for centuries. And yet, read verse 1 again. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Did you catch it that time? The word that Isaiah saw. Not heard, but saw. Right? It was a vision. I know, those prophets, what are you going to do? They're a little bit goofy, living out there on the edge, shouting at passers-by, running for their lives, hiding in caves, calling down fire and brimstone. I mean, yeah, those things did happen to prophets in the Bible. They didn't have an easy life. Their main job was to hold up a mirror, and no one likes looking too closely at themselves. I mean, it's no wonder that they weren't included at the best parties. It's no wonder they got bounced from the best clubs. It's no wonder that no one wanted them around. Not for long, anyway. Except this is Isaiah. He's not your normal run-of-the-mill prophet. He's not a backwoods, wild-eyed, messy-haired, bad-teeth prophet of the street corners. He's not one of those guys holding up a cardboard sign saying the end is near. No, Isaiah is as corporate as prophets get. He was as much an insider as any of them. He had an office down the hall from the king. He had a secretary who took his notes and typed them up for press release, at least at first, at least before that whole house of cards that was Judah fell. Now, he didn't spout a party line. He wasn't a mouthpiece for the king. In fact, it's kind of amazing that he was able to keep his job for as long as he did, given that more often than not, all he had was bad news to share. Fingers to point, doom to pronounce. I mean, maybe those in power considered him a lightning rod. As long as he was there giving the people warnings, calling them to a higher standard, then nothing bad would actually happen. It makes you wonder if anyone actually ever listened to him, or whether they just shook his hand every week at the back of the temple and said, nice sermon, Pastor Isaiah, and then went about their business. 
And Isaiah, he had to bite his tongue every now and then too, so he wouldn't say, weren't you listening to me? It was a messy time here at the beginning of the book, and then it just gets worse. When doom fell, when the enemy swept through, when the country crashed down around their ears, when they were left sitting in the middle of burning rubble, or they were carried away into exile in a foreign land, where they were sure that even God had abandoned them. That is all yet to come for Isaiah, for this is only chapter 2. But right now, it is palace intrigue. It is ringing the bell to call the powers that be back to the power that is. Now, it is warnings and worries and the day-to-day -day tedium of running a nation, and still Isaiah manages somehow to see more, to see farther, to see more clearly, to see better. The word that Isaiah saw. What did he see? The mountain of the Lord's house. I mean, it's another odd choice of words, kind of like Isaiah saw. The mountain of the Lord's house. But there it was, rising above every other mountain, above every other house, not to lord it from on high, but instead to invite the world, right, so that it was standing there so that people could see it. People were invited. The world was invited, not to conquer, but to teach, to give wisdom. And what will be taught by God's people? Peace, the end of war, and all that that brings, how it tears the very fabric of our existence as human beings. The house of the Lord, the people of God, will teach peace and farming, apparently, because I guess if you aren't going to kill them, then you better learn how to feed them. And Isaiah could see all of that. He could see the hope. He could see the word at work, even when the opposite was actually happening all around him. Even there in the corridors of power in Jerusalem that seemed hell-bent on making things worse rather than better, even as people went merrily down the path that led them to destruction, Isaiah saw the word at work. Isaiah saw another way, another hope. And that seems to me to be the call of Advent that it is not about proclaiming doom, but to see hope, to see possibilities even when no one else can see them. We are called not to give up on hope, but to walk instead in the light of God. To walk by the light we see in hope. To move towards the kind of world that God has in store. To work for what makes peace even while we work to repair what is broken. And we do all of this. We do it all with God's help, with the hope of Christ's transforming love, a love that is made real in the coming of the Christ child. Are you ready for Christmas yet? Amen. Our hymn is sung by Marianne McVicker, Dona Nobis Pacem which translated from Latin means grant us peace. <laughs> 